Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the MESAC Munitech Academy uh, session on ICS and SCADA cybersecurity. Um, we're going to start off today by, uh, first I'll introduce myself. I'm Don Hester. I'm an IT auditor um, and cybersecurity consultant. Many of uh, the local governments here in California will recognize me. I've been at uh, MESA conferences and am an auditor for many of them. Um, if you need to reach out to me, if you have questions after uh, this, you can. there's my email. Uh, you can also check out my blog where we have uh, other information, uh, or you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, all of these sessions that I normally do, I also put on YouTube, so they're available as well there. Uh, anyways, today I wanted to uh, do some housekeeping first. And if you have any questions during the live event, please uh, fill out the questions there. Uh, if you have them after, in other words, you watch a recording of this at a later date, you can go ahead and go ahead and send a message. You can go to Loon Security and type in, um, there's a form there to contact me, uh, and you can do this. Uh, if you need uh, continuing education credit for this, um, there is a certificate uh, on the screen there, and it'll tell how long you've watched the seminar. Um, and that's what you would use for your CE. Uh, and you can also download the slides here uh, to sh show you where to do that. And, and when we're done with this, please rate the session. We uh, like your feedback. Um, during the session, you, you'll see that it says ask a question. Uh, and then you click on that to ask a question. You'll see also attachments if you want to download the attachments. Um, and any of the rate this and details are also there. If you're watching it recorded, you'll also notice that you don't have an ask a question box there. Um, so if you have a question, just send me an email or reach out in one of the other ways. Also, if you want to see your uh, certificate for viewing, it'll be up there in the right-hand corner. You, hopefully, you can see the little box around it. Uh, that is where you would go to download your certificate, and it'll give you a certificate. It actually tells you how many minutes you were in the session. So. Um, you get a perfect, uh, you, whatever your timing is for whatever continuing education that you're doing, uh, if you need that, is in there. Without further ado, I like to, usually like to give you some kind of way, talking about ICS security, I typically like to um, like relate it to something that we can all relate to. Um, and so I'm going to pick Star Wars in this instance. And I was at a security conference, and they had this up there. And I was like, wow, this is kind of a, a really good, you know, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, what, how do you want to say that? It's like a really good cybersecurity um, illustration. That's what it is. Is the thermal port on the Death Star for Star Wars, right? It's just one little open port, and that caused the problem, right? That blew up the whole entire thing. And when we look at ICS security, that's one of the things that we have to take into consideration. It's, it only takes one. It's only one vulnerability that usually gets the hackers into a network. Um, and then once they're in, they usually make uh, a great deal of progress before they're either caught or they're able to execute their plans, uh, as we have seen in the number of local governments that have been recently hit with ransomware. Um, so uh, it, it only takes one port, right? Or it only takes one person um, to do that. Um, Somebody had just asked a question. The PDF's not downloading. Let me let you know something. Bright Talk has had problems all morning, or I've had problems with them trying to upload stuff all morning. Um, so try again in a little bit. Um, and if you still have problems at the end of the presentation, um, we'll get it to you somehow. Um, or it may just work here in a little bit. Uh, so terminology. Um, so one of the things we need to um, talk about terminology is to kind of, you know, make sure that we all are on the same page with this. And so you you end up getting a lot of marketing materials, and they talk about IT versus OT. Sometimes they talk about IoT, and sometimes they talk about ICS. And when we talk about OT, we're talking about operational technology. And typically what that is encompassing is anything that's not IT-related, it's still technology, but it's usually used on a plant, on a plant level. So um, if you're a water district and you have water pipes and, and pumps and all that kind of stuff, we would call that operational technology. I think it's a newer term because I think in the past we've always called it ICS. Um, so it, it's an example of one of the – I guess it's one of those examples where there's a new term out there, and so sometimes people see it, sometimes they don't know what it is. Uh, and IoT, now what's interesting about IoT is people typically 
um, are talking about if Internet of Things, and they talk about everything that's not the traditional computer, server, printer, and, and those types of things. So it's everything from cameras to uh, uh, other types of devices. Uh, and sometimes you will find that they're even using IoT to talk about the operational technology or the ICS systems. Um, and I think there's probably uh, – and I've seen a lot of debates. You can go on Reddit and you can see some debates between IoT versus OT. And, you know, it, all of that I think doesn't matter. It's technology and we need to protect it, right? So let's kind of push all of that aside and say, okay, what do we need to do to protect this, whatever it is? If it's technology and we're in charge of it, how do we protect it? And that's, I think, the way to look at it and not get wrapped around the axle trying to figure out, well, is this OT or is this ICS or – you know, street cameras, are they IoT or are they OT, right? So I see a lot of people talk about that, and they don't – it doesn't matter what we label is what I'm getting at. What we really care, are concerned about is what does it need to be protected? Um, and it does – you will find that some of these items will have their own specific types of threats and vulnerabilities that they have, but you will find that whether it's IoT or OT or ICS, however you want to call it, if it's any of those categories, they're going to have some of the very similar – uh, vulnerabilities and threats that they're uh, going to face. And so I kind of like talked to, about them together as one in, in this session, um, but you will find that even when you get to guidance on how to use it, ICS has different guidance than IoT. And I'll split that out for you in this session as well, just so that you're kind of understanding where everybody's coming from. But then at the end, I'm going to say, hey, here's the one thing you should just do, <laughs> right? Um, so hopefully we're going to take a little bit of a divergent path here. We'll talk about IoT, we'll talk about ICS, and then we'll bring it back together at the end. Um, and I think that that's a good way to do it. Uh, there's other types of – I just like to put these up here because there's terms sometimes uh, people will talk about SCADA or DCS or PLCs or, um, and cyber physical systems. Um, and we're – you know, and sometimes people talk about cyber physical systems and they're talking about utilities and – and again, you can call it operational technology. You can call it ICS. Um, you know, the definition of operational technology kind of doesn't even fit it in some instances. But again, I don't want to get wrapped around the wheel with it. I want to make sure you understand what all the terminology is or the acronyms are. But going forward, let's not worry about what we call it. Let's worry about what we need to do to fix it, what we need to do to secure it. Um, and that makes sure hopefully there's no marketing hype that we run into. So there's one of the issues that we're having today is that we have billions of connected devices. We have cell phones, tablets, game consoles, appliances, thermostats, uh, medical monitoring systems. Uh, we have uh, video conferencing systems, digital cameras. Uh, I have a sous vide cooker, and it connects to the Internet so that I can monitor what the temperature is, you know. Um, some of the headlights in cars are now connected. I'm not sure why they need to be, but sure. Uh, there's all kinds of other things. But, and a lot of that is more the IoT type of stuff, right? Then you get into all the building automation, the plant automation, the robots in the plants, uh, the sensors that you may have out there. Maybe you have satellites. Maybe you're like NASA. Uh, drones, conference room controls, TVs, projectors, all the smart city stuff, right? Um, building access control, street lights, uh, pumps uh, in the plant. Um, so you have and security systems as well. All of these things are now connected. They used to be very much unconnected, and typically were not under IT's control necessarily. Uh, typically what you found, if you went back, like, let's go back 20 years, let's go back to 2000, uh, typically, most of your camera systems would be run by the security folks uh, in the physical security area. Uh, and most of their cameras were connected with coax cable, and that did not connect in at all with the IT system. And if it did, there may have been a computer that was a monitor that just basically read the, the video feeds, right? It was just a monitor for that. Uh, now, fast forward 20 years, everything is connected to a network. It has an IP address, all the cameras, uh, sensors, door alarms, door access controls, all of that is now connected on there. And I think that there has been a good benefit to having them all connected. Um, I think one of the ways um, uh, that it really benefits is, is now we have one type of cable that we have to run, right? Um, or maybe two, uh, and we now have the ability 
to interoperate and change things very quickly. So there's a lot less cost sometimes in implementing something new because the infrastructure already exists, the IT infrastructure, um, if it has been kept up to date. Um, and we don't have to run a new trench to go to another building to run new set of coax. We can just put it on the backbone of the network, go to the next um, building, and then pull it out from the uh, switches or the routers that are there. So in some instances, it has opened up all kinds of opportunities for us. When you look at building automation, um, being able to cool a building and have a green uh, building and stuff like that ha requires lots of sensors and needs to know what doors are open, what the airflow is going on. So a lot of that uh, that is necessary, putting it all on the network, yeah, it does add more to the network, um, but it has actually helped save money for organizations. It has helped uh, make the world a better place because it's uh, helping with uh, the green technology and helping to reduce our carbon footprint. So there's a lot of benefits to it. The problem is, I think sometimes, is we look at all the benefits and then the people making the decisions didn't look at the risks related to it. And then that's where the issue kind of comes in, is did we look at the risk side of the equation and then we say, hey, this is not a traditional IT device. How do I put antivirus on this? I mean, that should have been a question that we asked, right? So how are we going to protect it from malware? It's now on the network. We know malware gets on the network. What are we going to do to fix it? And I think that question was never asked in, by the industry as a whole. Um, and it's now being asked, uh, which is a good thing, but the horse is already out of the barn, so to speak. <laughs> we should have probably uh, addressed that earlier. Oops. So a lot of people are talking about um, the IoT doomsday. In other words, we have all these devices that are connected, and because they're all connected, there's going to be this big issue one day that they're all going to get hacked. Well, and that may be true. I, I, I kind of don't think it's going to actually happen as bad as everybody makes it out to be. It's not going to be a doomsday because the IoT, the, the people making those devices have started – to implement security on those systems. We now have legislation that is pushing it into that direction. Um, so yeah, we still, right, we're, at this point in time, we're at a higher level of risk. Um, but I think there's ways that we can mitigate that. There's creative ways that we can mitigate that. And there's just the simple things that we always should have been doing, password management, those types of things, uh, that had we been doing it, that may have prevented those devices from being hacked. Now, not all of those vulnerabilities are because there was an easy password to guess. A lot of times it's just uh, sometimes cameras, you know, it's just uh, the firmware that's in those um, is easy to uh, hack into. So we're still working in that area. We have a long way to go because it seems to be on the IT side, uh, which I'm talking about traditional computers, we, we've started to get our act together, started to, um, as far as making secure systems. Um, and we're a little bit more mature there, but we're still like in our infancy for some reason. I feel like we're back in the 90s when we talk to an IoT device, you know, um, because just the, the basic controls are not there yet. They're starting to get there, uh, and, and that's a good thing. And so now when we, have, we talk about smart homes and smart cities and all this stuff, we're just talking about throwing a bunch of connected devices into it uh, for various different reasons, uh, some of which are really good. Uh, and some of which, you know, I just wonder what the benefit is. The fact that my uh, washing machine can connect to the Internet now, I don't know what the benefit is, um, so I don't let it connect. Um, I, it seems to clean flows just fine without it. I don't know what benefit I'm going to get out of it, and they didn't tell me when I was reading through the document. It just told me how to set it up to connect it to the Internet, and I'm like, yeah, no. Uh, but... Uh, I, for some reason, I do connect my sous vide cooker to it so I can control it from my phone. Don't know if that's necessarily a, a wise choice, but uh, I do find it interesting. And I do like techie gadget stuff too, but uh, it's just things that we need to kind of look at. I look at the risk of that and I'm like, you know what? I don't, it's on its own separate wireless network in my house. So it's not going to interfere with anything on my side. My, my house network is uh, segmented. Um, so you know, those are the things that we could have done in our own businesses, too. And sometimes we do segment, and sometimes people get past that segmentation. So that makes us think, what are we doing about our segmentation that we need to work on? Um, so Sophos, one of the antivirus ones, their CPO had a, a really good quote. 
uh, he says, so we're seeing that despite the defenses, as we put out there, the attackers are being more successful than we'd like to see. So in other words, we're putting out a lot of uh, controls out there. We're trying to get, mitigate vulnerabilities. We're trying to put in, uh, you know, anti-malware protection into the devices and stuff like that, but we're still seeing that they're being successful. So that means that what we're finding is that there are still vulnerabilities that have not been addressed that we need to work on. Um, and most of it, to be quite honest with you, is not necessarily our responsibility. It's more the vendor's responsibility. And unfortunately, we're in this position where the vendors are still making subpar products. And I'm going to say subpar, and I apologize to anybody that gets offended by that, but it, security should have been baked in from the beginning. Uh, th th it, this is not something that – this was not something that should be a surprise to anybody. If you connect something to a network, uh, it's going to possibly have a vulnerability, right? Um, and we just started doing that, so I, I think we really should have kind of known it. But I digress a little bit. So we're now starting to see that organizations, uh, individuals, and stuff like that, um, first of all, really telling is con consumers – are saying, hey, I don't feel safe necessarily with these things, but it doesn't seem to stop them from buying that TV that connects to the network, right? Um, so that's an interesting thing. Consumers say, hey, we don't trust it, but I'm going to go ahead and buy that PlayStation and stick it on the network, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and buy the dishwasher or the fridge that connects to the Internet, and I'm going to go ahead and connect it to the Internet, even though they don't have confidence that it's going to be secure. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what the disconnect is there. Now, I'm a cybersecurity person, so I obviously look at that and say, "Woo, I don't want to do that. Um, and most of my friends know me well enough um, that uh, they say, oh, I just bought this new thing. Oh, and I connected to the network. You probably wouldn't do that, would you? And I'm like, no, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> but um, uh, anyways, uh, so now we're starting to see that the lawmakers are starting to come up with cybersecurity bills. They're trying to look at California just passed a law for IoT devices that says that they need to protect the IoT devices. I'm really disappointed in our legislators. Um, they made the, the biggest provision in is that you have to have you can't have default passwords. Now, while that is like basic 101 cybersecurity, that in in itself is not enough to protect a device. I mean. I'm glad that they made that as a rule, but there was a whole bunch of other things that they should have added into that. Uh, the UK actually has a whole framework for that um, uh, in order to do that. So it's really interesting that we haven't seen uh, that. Uh, let's see. I just had a problem with BrightTalk, and now my website's not working. Sorry, folks. Um, it, it does appear that they're having issues. Let me see if I can reload this. Hopefully it doesn't break things, and it can't reach the website. Great. Sorry about that. We're having technical difficulties, apparently. And I can't get back into it. And I can't get into it. Give me one second, folks. I'm sorry about this. Apparently, everybody's working from home these days, and everybody's on Bright Talk or something. Don't know. Oh. And I'm not having internet connection. That seems to be what the issue is. Maybe it's not Bright Talk. Hey, Rob, can you do me a favor? Can you still see the screen? Yes, I can. Can you move it to the next one? <laughs> Since I am uh, dead in the water right now. There you go. You're a natural gas. Oh, so one of the recent articles that I had seen out there is that um, a plant was attacked, um, and and this one's recent. I want to say this is from like January, February. Um, that we're now starting to see that uh, attackers, not just nation states, and if you go back into my Bright Talk channel way back two years ago, I think it was, uh, I actually did a session where I talked about the um, uh, 
the, the rise in nation state attacks on ICS systems. So we know that Russia and them are trying to, trying to attack um, like critical infrastructure, right? Utilities and the such. We found that that is, um, it seems to be a common theme um, in the way that Russia does uh, before they attack. A, they did it in the Ukraine. They did it in the state of Georgia, not the state of Georgia in the United States, the country of Georgia. Um, that before they launched any type of an attack there, they would uh, attack the critical infrastructure first. Uh, we've noticed that they have been trying to attack our critical infrastructure, and, and we we know that certain nation states, Iran, North Korea, uh, all of those have also been engaged in this. And so, but now what we've seen recently is we see criminals now trying to do it, where criminals weren't doing it before, they're now doing it now. So. It's an interesting uh, situation that we're now entering into is now used to be just nation states that were trying to disrupt things. Now we kind of see that uh, cyber security criminals, uh, cyber security, cyber criminals are the ones trying to uh, do those things as well. Um, you want to go to the next slide, which I don't even sure what it is. You have to tell me what it is. Idaho National Lab Researcher. Gotcha. Um, and so now we're also kind of saying, oh, got back in. Um, thank goodness. This is really kind of strange. So everybody out there, this is the new normal of working from home um, <laughs> with poor interconnection, internet connections, because everybody's connected in remotely. Uh, it's been kind of a challenge these days, hasn't it? Anyways, so if people listening to this in the future, they're going to be like, what is he talking about? We're talking about COVID-19 and how everybody has to work from home. Um, anyways. Uh, so we're finding out that people are looking for and trying to buy zero-day uh, exploits uh, for ICS systems. Uh, in other words, that there is a market for them. Um, and not just nation states against cyber criminals are looking into those areas of uh, trying to do that. Uh, Dark Trace did a instant response thing. And they say that IoT devices, um, because of just the way they're designed, are obviously targeted by some of the threat actors. We have seen where ransomware attackers have attacked um, a, a local government. They break into the government, and then they hide in systems that are not traditional IT systems, whether it be the phone system or into cameras or, or any of these other IoT devices. Uh, in one case, uh, a TV uh, in a conference room, they break into that system so that they can remain in the network after you clean everything up. Because if you think about it, if you get hit with ransomware, do you think, oh, that TV or that monitor that is in the conference room that's connected to the network also needs to, we need to check it out, make sure that it is not compromised. That doesn't always happen. Um, and that's what they're baiting on. Uh, so we have to kind of look at this thing. And the way I look at it this way, we have to look at all of our technology. And we have to say, how do we implement these basic controls on all the technology that we have? And the hard thing for IT is IT all of a sudden gets roped into things that they never had anything to do with. They're, you know, that normally engineers had to deal with, whether it be street cameras or, or uh, street lights or whatever it is, all of a sudden it's on the network, all of a sudden now you're going to be responsible for making sure it's secure. And what I have seen as an auditor going to some cities, those devices and stuff get stuck on the network, and the engineers are still running it, and they're not paying attention to cybersecurity, and IT is not usually a part of the process of, one, either evaluating what the risks are related to it, and, two, figuring out what we should do to mitigate those risks. And unfortunately, there's this disconnect that I find with most cities, not all, um, in other local governments, is that, you know, you have the right hand and the left hand, they're not talking to each other. And this is a problem. We need to get it all together in one place. Not that IT should take over from the engineers running all of those devices. No, not by any means. Um, I don't think IT people as we are, are qualified to handle some of that stuff. What we want to make sure is that at least that the network it's on and that what they do to protect it is at least the thing that we can bring to them. They're in, the engineers are just now starting to hear about cybersecurity and why it's important. Uh, I go to a conference, uh, IFMA conference. It's for uh, like building automation people, data centers and stuff like that. The engineers there that run all the devices and generators and you know door systems or whatever it is, uh, they're just now starting to talk about cybersecurity. 
And I go to their conference and I just like, I'm dumbfounded sometimes. I'm like, this is some of the most basic stuff I've ever heard. And for them, it's the first time they're hearing it because these engineers who, you know, are really good with making the machines work have not been introduced to cybersecurity. And I think that this is where we can come in to help them and to make sure, because to tell you the truth, if I was in your shoes, I would not want to take over managing the maintenance end of all of that stuff. They can do it. They know what they're doing, but they need to understand the cybersecurity. And we need to get them up uh, to a much more mature level of cybersecurity uh, than they currently are at um, and do what we can to help them implement the controls that they need to. Um, so if you're a water district, I'm sure you've seen the 2008 uh, American Water Works Association's report. And basically they're saying that their number one threat that they feel is uh, attacking critical infrastructure is cyber risk. Everything else is kind of like secondary right now. They understand that cyber risk is one of the most important things. So we're getting there. Everybody, everybody knows that we got a problem. So now how do we fix it, I guess, is one of the things. Um, we're starting to see all kinds of uh, different types of uh, people attacking everything, from satellites to elevator controllers. I mean, everything is uh, uh, starting to get attacked. Uh, things that you would never think of before. Uh, so I do have a question. It says, there is a valid argument to be made that OT segment segment prioritizes safety followed by the productivity in the IT segment prior to system security above all and both are correct. The age purpose construction of a large number of OT endpoints necessitates placing perimeter security far above endpoint security. Router IT procedures, automated update patch deployments are actually more dangerous on the factory floor, so our different way of thinking is required. I agree with that. I, 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 I agree with it. In fact, one of the things I'll talk about here is the vulnerability management aspect of it, which I'm going to do a whole other presentation on that. Um, it'll be on this Bright Talk channel. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when I'm, I'm working on it right now. Um, uh, the vulnerability management side of those devices, you can't do that on a factory floor. You can't just do patch management. You can't just do patch and pray um, because, one, it could be a life safety issue, and two, um, you could totally destroy a whole production line. Um, so this gets back to what – but if you go to uh, proper patch management, what is proper patch management? It's not patch and pray. It's not patch and then, hey, let's hope that it works. Um, like I think that many of us do. It is actually patch its test system, verify that it functions correctly, and then roll that patch out to the rest of the live environment, right? So there's a whole process of change control that seems to be missing when it comes to patch management. And the reason why it misses is because it is too onerous most of the time for us. So we don't have the staff, the resources to test every patch that Microsoft puts down the pipe, let alone what uh, – office tools are doing, what the line of business applications are doing, what the ERPs patches are doing. So typically what we do is we just patch the thing. Um, and unless we have something that's super critical, we very rarely test it on a test environment and then roll it out uh, to the live environment. Um, but that is what we need to do on those OT systems. We need to patch them uh, as soon as we possibly can, but we need to test it and then roll it out. Um, so I think that that's where – I think that's the thing we struggle with. So my point in all of this is we already have procedures that work. We're just not applying those procedures because we're not doing it over here, so we don't apply that procedure that we should be using anyways over there. So this is all common uh, – it's all in the NIST guidelines. Uh, so no surprise if you know me that I'm going to start talking about NIST. But it's in the NIST guidelines that we do that. Um, so if we just applied that to OT, we would be set. I think. Not 100%, but anyways. Uh, another question was, convincing IT of this difference is critical and often supported by the C-level executives. OT by necessity is more vulnerable than any other air gap. There is so, only so much you can do. You're absolutely right. There's, there's only so much that we can do. We're going to have to just uh, do what we can, but let's see what we can do. Because there's, there's some stuff that we can do. Um, and um, I don't want to go through the whole history of this, but there is there's a history. This is not nothing new with people attacking these types of systems. Going back to 1997, uh, we had a, a kid hacker just bake, uh, hack into the phone systems to take over an FAA uh, tower. Um, you know, so you can look up some of these things. 
Uh, we had a guy in Australia. He didn't get the job at a sewage uh, plant, so he attacked it and then let all the sewage out into the river. Uh, so, um, so we that was in 2000. That was 20 years ago. So we should have known. Hey, there's a problem here. We need to fix it. Um, um, and I think sometimes people don't really consider security until it really starts to hurt uh, or until more people get hit. We've had nuclear power plants, which you would think had more security, but apparently not. They've been hit. Uh, remember Stuxnet? Now, I don't know that you could protect yourself from Stuxnet because this was the most sophisticated uh, worm that was made, uh, believed to be made by uh, American Israeli or one of us or both of us or something. Uh, time will tell to actually attack Iran and to take out their nuclear centrifuges and destroy them. But uh, it was probably one of the most sophisticated ones that we've ever seen. So it's really interesting to see that uh, that was 10 years ago, um, right? Uh, so this was like the nation state. This is like the first salvo of the uh, cyber warfare. Not really the first salvo. This is kind of like the first uh, uh, mother of all bombs type of cyber weapon, you know, that's been out there. Uh, and I guarantee every other nation state, Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, um, and then all the what we would consider allies like the UK and others are working on these types of things uh, as we speak. Um, and unfortunately, if you're critical infrastructure and you're really, you're always going to be a target for other nation states and they're going to have m far more resources and money to kind of spend and trying to get past even an air gap that you have. Um, so looking at that air gap and making sure that air gap is going to be secure is going to be one of those things that we have to look at too. Um, and here's a bunch of other incidents, not to go over all of them, but, you know, over the last 20 years, we've had plenty of incidents that were huge incidences um, where critical infrastructure was either attacked or either, uh, you know, we had a German steel mill that was attacked in 2014. Um, and we had a ransomware attack recently, I want to say in the last six to eight months, uh, was attacked. Maybe it was the end of last year. Uh, I think it's in Denmark or something like that, uh, and they are out of business. Um, the attack was so devastating to their uh, thing, they filed for bankruptcy or whatever it is over there, uh, and they're out of business. So they're, obviously, if we're local government, we're not going out of business, but uh, things can happen. Uh, TV's getting infected with stuff, too. Again, not, I don't want to go over all the history with you guys, but I want to make sure you know about it. Going slow. Oh, so, you know, uh, this is an old story, too. Uh, this goes back, well, 2013, so I guess it's not too old. But uh, China hacking uh, using a, uh, a, a hot pot kettle, you know, those little kettles that you use, and you probably have one in your break room that heats up water so you can make tea or whatever it is. Uh, those things, um, they were putting wireless adapters in them so that they could snoop on the network and then take the information off the network and send it um, uh, phone home and let people know about it. Hacking cars, nothing new. You've probably seen that before. Um, oh, and then just creepy stuff happening too with this kind of stuff, Alexa and all that kind of stuff, people listening in on conversations. Obviously in a business, it's kind of an important thing to not have those types of devices uh, in a location um, where you may be talking about critical information. Um, Anyways, we're seeing also a good, and I'll give you the information on this at the end. If you don't already have it, you may already have it, because I'm sure MS ISAC uh, has posted that the CISA has a website for ICS security, um, and they will send out alerts on a regular basis. Um, and I want to say like last week, I got like 10 all at once. So I got 10 emails about all these different devices that have vulnerabilities. And, and I think one of the things that I that we don't do really well is look at that list of devices that comes out and ask ourselves, do we have any of this in our inventory? Because what I found is that most organizations, when I say, okay, do you have an inventory of your ICS systems? The IT people are like, I have no idea. You have to ask the engineers. You ask the engineers, the engineers are all like, well, it's in the computer and they don't really even use it. Um, you know, we just have it in there because it's, you know, it's, it's a regular inventory of stuff. But there's no cross-checking with, okay, do we have this Siemens controller that is now being listed as having a vulnerability 
And then what are we doing about that? Are we are we addressing what the risk is? What's the risk? So you read the bulletin that the CISA has come out on it or what the manufacturer has out on it and see if there is a patch or anything that they have for it. Or maybe it's not that big of a risk that you need to do anything with it. But risk management requires that we at least ask the question and then document what our decision was and why we decided to either not implement a control or whether we are going to say, okay, we need to start working on figuring out a patch for that system, or if somebody is attacking that system in that way, what would that look like? How do I check the network that this is on to see if any of that's going on? Uh, another uh, big thing with this is uh, some people like work on the endpoints and they don't, they don't work on the cross network traffic. Uh, there's a mistake there. And the mistake in only looking at the end, uh, only looking at what's going in and out of the ICS network if you have one, uh, is that it only takes once for them to get past. If they can get past, they will try to hide their command and control traffic uh, in normal looking traffic, right? So uh, once they infect something on the inside, what they will do is they'll set up, you know, whatever the normal type of traffic is. If there's 443 going to a certain IP address, they'll try and get and send their command and control stuff for the device that they've taken over on that type of network or that type of protocol on that type of port. So it's harder for those devices, the firewalls or whatever, you know, intrusion detection systems that you have are trying to uh, catch that. But that gives them free reign inside the network. So they only have to talk to one device. They can kind of obscure that talking to that. And then from there, that device can attack everything else that's in the ICS network. Well, that's where the issue is. So we want to be able to actually watching the east and west side of all the traffic on that network as well. And, and actually, it's quite easy with an ICS system to see something out of the normal. Why? Because they normally only talk to certain devices, usually only sensors only usually talk back to certain areas. And whether it's going back to the historian or the, the audit logging device, these devices do not have a lot of odd traffic. They're very particular about the traffic. So finding an anomaly on a network is actually a lot easier on ICS than it is on a regular network, a regular uh, traditional IT network. Um, so maybe one of the controls we look for is to look for someone trying to exploit that type of vulnerability on those devices. Um, that's just one idea, but um, obviously there, it may not be feasible in all instances, but we want to be able to look at those types of things as well. Um, and we're starting to see a rise in botnets, this is more of the not plant side of things. Uh, I don't know that we've seen devices taken over um, that are inside of a plant, let's just uh, say, to, that are used in a botnet, but we've seen a heck of a lot of cameras uh, get broken into um, and any of those other types of devices. I want to say one of them <coughs> was parking meters uh, that was used as a part of a botnet. Um, so if you're a city, local government, and one of your IoT or ICS devices may be um, you know, parking meters. Uh, and when you connect those, um, you, that's another risk. What are we going to do about that risk? Um, and, and the risk of this is oh, wait, maybe this is not in your network. Maybe they attack it and turn it into a botnet. Uh, and you have it segmented. You've got an air gap. So they're not going to get into the city network. Great. But now all of your parking meters are all screwed up. They're all attacking somebody else or they put ransomware on it or they will put in devices to try and read credit card information. So if you have credit card ones. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things that they can do with those types of devices. So great, we air gaffed them, but if they get into that network um, and they take over those devices, we still have a problem, right? Um, we don't want to have any lost revenue <laughs> um, because our parking meters are down because of a, you know, a, someone attacked us or ransomware us or um, uh, you know, used it to attack other, uh, other organizations, right? So those are the types of things we have to look at. We can't just, I think sometimes we look at some risk and we don't look at all of the risk, but um, that's more about botnets. <laughs> Somebody said parking meter, that's justice. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, if your parking meters don't work and I have to go to your city, then I don't care. <laughs> right, then I don't have to pay. Uh, but uh, I'm sure the city uh, finance people would like to get the money in, right? Uh, you've got streets to fix. Uh, but uh, so... Uh, so there's a lot of uh, credentials for a lot of devices that have been out there. One of the things I think that uh, a lot of cybersecurity firms are starting to do is monitor the dark web to see what's being sold out there, to see if they can get us that information. Um, and, um, uh, um, and 
the interesting thing is if we're monitoring the dark web, we can sometimes find out, you know, what kind of credentials are being sold or what type of information is there um, because we may find out, oh, there's a zero day that someone's trying to sell for this Siemens ICS controller uh, or here's snippets of control uh, for uh, uh, these devices. Here's how to take over a camera. Those types of things, we know that, then we can uh, address that. And we're relying typically on MSISAC to try and give us this information, or CISA to give us this information, uh, other local governments to give us this information. Problem is most of this is not getting to us until something's actually happened. Uh, we don't have enough people on the dark web trying to figure out what's going on. So now you're starting to see organizations that are actually part of the services that they're offering is they're monitoring the dark web for you, and they're going to give you information. I think one of the, the password management programs that's out there, I'm not sure which one it is, and it may be more than one. Uh, when I was at the RSA uh, uh, network, uh, conference this year, they said, oh, by the way, if we manage your passwords for you, we have a hash of all your passwords. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'm not necessarily happy about that, but okay, I get it. Um, and we can pair that with hashes of passwords uh, and user accounts that we found on the internet to tell you whether or not these accounts or people using those email addresses uh, have been compromised and are being sold on the dark web. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a cool thing, right? Now I got somebody actually monitoring the dark web for at least credentials, um, and it can kind of look at employees' passwords and tell them that they have weak passwords and, and that kind of stuff. So we're starting to see that kind of stuff. I think we need a little bit more of that because there's a lot of stuff that's on sale out there uh, that if we knew if it was on sale, we'd say, oh, we have one of those devices now we know that someone's selling something on it. Now's the time to maybe look at that and protect it. And of course, this takes a full-time security person. IT people typically don't have time to do this and still put out fires of all the other problems and take care of end users' needs and make sure that you're delivering services that uh, the organization needs. Um, so yeah, you have employees doing stuff too. And then you have uh, instances where someone's a casinos uh, they got into the high roller database and they got into it through a lobby fish tank. So the controls on the fish tank, the pumps or whatever it was, basically an IoT device, um, basically were able to hack into that and get, now this one's been in the news, so you probably already heard about it. Uh, but think about that. You're the IT person in the network, uh, you work for the casino. Do you think that that is even on your radar, that that's on your network? Is that a part of any risk management question ever until that happened? right? Nobody probably even thought about it. Um, and and I, I like to look at it this way. If something is on the network, then I need to secure it, period. Um, and if I have to shove my face into the face of the engineers and say, look, if it's going to be on the network, you need to follow certain rules. Otherwise, you're not on our network, period. Or we can't provide services for you because, one, we can't provide services that are not going to uh, help protect the city or the, the district or whoever it is. And you have to do it with uh, honey and not a stick because you won't get very far if you're just trying to tell them what to do, right? So you got to do that balance there. So the, uh, the bad guys are hacking in any, anything and everything that they can. So everything is fair game. So that's why everything needs to be uh, protected in one way or another. Um, they're attacking garage door openers. But in this case, this is a funny story, and it's kind of off the beat, but, you know, it's I, I like to put it in there because you need a little laugh here. So this guy gets a, a, a remote-controlled garage door, and so he decides he's going to write a bad review for the company because they have a disagreement. And so he writes a bad review, and then they try to take care of it, and uh, so the guy is just being – I guess at that point in time, if they offer a refund and you decide you still want to be mad at the company and complain about stuff or whatever. Um, so they ended up just shutting his system off. They bricked it. Um, uh, so the, the vendor actually just took it and said, okay, well, then you can't use it anymore. Boom, your account's deleted. Uh, you can't control your garage door anymore. So this, you know, this is funny, right? So you, you get a vendor that gets uh, upset at the uh, end user because the end user is mad at them and bricks them. And here's the funny thing, though. Think about that. You have IoT devices that may be in your network, whether it's a, a system that um, controls your conference room or whatever. And it has to, in order for you to remotely control it, you have to have an account with 
uh, them. The security cameras we have at our office, that's how they work. The video goes to the cloud. I control it from the cloud. So anywhere in the world I can see it. Great, that's what we went with. But if I ever don't pay that bill, guess what? I don't have access to it, right? So that's not a big deal. I, we calculated the cost. You know, part of the total cost of ownership is an annual fee that we're going to have. But have you ever thought if you got into an argument with them about something, maybe they overcharged you or something like that, you make a stink about it, and then you say, oh, well, sorry, we'll just turn you off. Um, so now that's another risk. And this, this, this is a different type of risk than the cyber risk we've been talking about. This is supply chain risk, right? Um, and that is, do you have a good relationship with your supply chain? Um, and so that's a part of the whole thing. So it's a funny type of thing, but yeah. Uh, and, and now we talk about governments that say, hey, we're going to hack into IoT devices so nobody else can hack into them. So that's a really good idea. Uh, anyways. <laughs> Um, and then this has been going on for a while, and there's there's arguments about whether or not motherboards or any other type of board that is in any other type of electronic may have spy chips on it. Now, if it's on a, a server, um, supposedly some people found those, and I still don't know where this is. Uh, it goes back and forth, uh, whether or not there actually is something there or not. There is something on the motherboard that's different than the plans for the, the people uh, that sent it to be manufactured, there's definitely something there. What exactly does, I don't know that that's ever been answered. Um, but anyways, those are the other types of things. Uh, yeah, the, the factory fault passwords weren't changed. Uh, again, this is like, and we should all know this, right? We all know this in IT. The problem is the people that sometimes implement these things don't know that because, again, the engineers and those, they're not cybersecurity folks. They haven't been talking about cybersecurity for the last 20 years. Um, they're just now starting to talk about it. And so a lot of times default passwords aren't changed on devices. Now, granted, California just made that law. That's great for California stuff. But guess what? People are still going to buy stuff off the Internet. They're still going to get it. And because all people that make IoT devices still haven't gotten onto this of getting rid of default passwords, um, we're still going to have that as an issue. Even though it's a law here in California, uh, you're still, you could still end up with devices that don't have default passwords changed on them, which is unfortunate. Um, people breaking into cameras on systems to spy. Now think about this. This is a, a, a interesting one because um, I know some people that have data centers and they don't want people in the data center. And so they've gone to buying these type of vacuums uh, to go in and basically sweep the floor and not, you know, not that um, you're going to, Typically, you shouldn't get a whole lot of dust in the data center, but in some of the other data centers, they're actually using these uh, in those devices. But if you had one that has a camera on it and someone can hack into it, they can spy in, they can see your internal network, or they can see inside your facilities. Now, I don't know what they would be able to do with that other than they could see what kind of devices are there if they get into your network and they try to hack into it, or if they want to do a physical intrusion, they could do that. I don't think many of us are going to have this issue um, uh, is a big concern, but it's things. Did we think about this before we implemented it? Uh, and the folks that did had not thought about it, um, that were using it in a data center. Oh, and then the spy dolls. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is another one. It's just, it's just to the point where it's getting ridiculous, right? So uh, organ people hacking into anything, including uh, toys, in order to try and get – espionage information. Um, and you got all kinds of other things that you have on your network, like your smart thermostat, your camera, your Alexa, your whatever you have that's connected in your house. Uh, all of it probably is spying on you. You know, it's funny. We, <laughs> the last Friday, um, I was social distancing out on a trail. So I went out and went for a hike. And we did uh, uh, a really long hike. And we were talking, and we were had internet spotty coverage, and we were talking about some um, different things. We were talking about, uh, actually, we were, we were talking about Dungeons and Dragons. I'll admit it. Uh, we were talking about making Dungeon and Dragon maps, and we were talking about, you know, how the Lord of the Rings has a map, and um, you know that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien made, and all that kind of stuff. We got back to my house. My buddy was getting ready to go home and he checked his phone and guess what there was an ad on his phone for <laughs> a middle earth map and so yes you're always being spied on uh and um at some point you know 
that type of being spied on is uh, kind of interesting. But here, here's the thing. If you go out to, like, uh, there's certain areas that you go to in the federal government, like at Lawrence Livermore Lab, there's certain areas that you go to where you're not allowed to have your cell phone, and it's for good reason. So it's those types of things that you should probably think about, and is there a risk in any type of thing that you're having, uh, just even on your own self, is this a private conversation I don't want anybody to know? Now, the fact that I may mention that I have a really cool Jeep and that I want to get, you know, bigger tires for it or a lift kit, great. Listen to me, phone, and go ahead and send me ads. I don't really care about that, right? Because I, I want to know about any sale deals that might be on those things or that might prompt me to buy those things. So I think a lot of us kind of take that privacy getting lost as, as, as something that we don't necessarily worry too much about because they may be trying to sell me something I really want. Um, but when it comes to the cybersecurity side of things, not just the privacy side of things, that same device we're carrying around in our workplace too. And are we having conversations that are HR related that we really shouldn't be having that somebody at Amazon or Google could possibly be listening to the actual conversation of, right? So that's another type of thing. These IoT devices, uh, what about TVs that have microphones on them that you could do like video calls and stuff like that? Is that another device that we need to be concerned about that is in a conference room that we now have private conversations in uh, about something critical? Uh, things that we need to think about, obviously. Uh, so we had vending machines that got hit. Uh, you can look there. There's you download the slides. You can follow all the links on this. I'm not going to go over all this stuff. Airplanes getting hacked. That's one I don't want to hear about. But um, some people will take over your IoT devices, cyber criminals, like your parking meters or your street lights or whatever. They'll break into those devices and not use them as – they'll use them as a botnet, but not to do a decile of service attack, but to go and log into Instagram and like people's pictures. Like literally, this is how they're making money. So these people will go, if you have an Instagram account or a Facebook account or any other social media, and you're trying to get your uh, channel or your, your stuff to be out there and seen, you're going to go to a firm that they're supposedly going to help you market it, that stuff. So you go there and you say, hey, I want, you know, um, I want to get more likes or whatever it is. They will actually sell the botnet, they're not telling you that they're selling the botnet. The botnet will go in, log into Instagram accounts, and then start liking all kinds of things, right? So now here's the thing. You have IoT devices. You have um, – uh, let, let's, let's just stick with parking meters. You have parking meters. You have them on a separate network, but in that network, are you blocking traffic out of that network going to places like Instagram, Right. Have you thought about that? So, so if this is what they're kind of doing with it, they take over a network and then they, they take over devices, IoT devices, and they use those devices to log into Instagram or Facebook or whatever to give people likes, um, that's a waste of your resources. Granted, you may think, well, that's not that harmful. Well, yeah, but they're, they broke into your network and they can do other things later on. Uh, cyber criminals don't think, oh, I'm just going to break into this network, make a botnet, and I'm only going to sell likes to Instagram. No, they're going to think, oh, I can use this for denial of service. Let me see if they have credit card information on this. Most of the credit card information has a, a, a secure devices inside of it, so you, that's not as big of a threat depending on what uh, version you have. But, um, but there's those types of things that are a concern for us that we should be addressing it nonetheless. Um, so, again, are we monitoring that network to see if it's doing weird things like going to Instagram or not? Because uh, if it is going to Instagram, that should be a number one pop. It, this network that is an ICS system or an IoT system, what business does it have going to Instagram? Zero. So how do we make sure that we block all that um, so that that's not an issue? Uh, again, this is just um, th that idea that I'm talking about is blocking everything going out except for where those IoT devices have to go. So the firewall blocking everything in and blocking everything out except for what communication on what port needs to go where, to what IP address. So in, in instances like that, I would take the camera network, the segment that the camera is on, and the camera network can only connect to one DNS name, that is the name of the website that the cameras talk to, and only the range of IP addresses that that vendor has, and only on 443. 
that network can't go anywhere else. Nothing inside that network can go to any other IP address externally or any other domain externally. You make firewall rules that strict in and out, then you can kind of start to curtail some of this. That's really what we need to do to, to really ironclad that. And, and even in cases like that, the people have done that, sometimes uh, that isn't enough. But in most, in most cases, most of these attacks uh, would be thwarted with that kind of uh, uh, blocking everything out, uh, everything that's outbound, blocking it. Uh, and also connect, uh, controlling the DNS requests. So you can actually rec control the DNS requests out because most command and control that hackers are using in order to control your devices, they have to constantly switch uh, domain names because we find out that this domain has been, been used by a command and control network, and then every firewall will start blocking it. So that means they have to constantly move around. This guy, uh, I think it was called the Belarusian, um, and he had attacked, uh, he had 35,000 domain names registered that he was using um, to control, use this command and control networks. Um, and when uh, Microsoft and um, Assist and uh, Interpol all worked together to catch this guy and they caught him, they took all those domain names and put them into a black hole so they could see, you know, how many devices were actually using his command and control network. It was 2 million. I believe it was 2 million. I may be off, but it was millions. Um, anyways, so if you're filtering all the DNS or you're limiting the DNS to only go to one DNS, they can't control it. You destroy the command and control network, right? So sometimes you have to think outside the box, right? Um, anyways, and that's not really thinking outside the box. Guess what? NIST is telling you to do these things. Um, so I don't want to spoil the end, but I, I'm going to keep on pointing towards that. Uh, biometric devices getting hacked. Uh, medical IoT, um, if you have any medical stuff. Um, uh, internet connected lockers. Uh, one of them was in, what was it? I think it, it was in an amusement park, an unnamed amusement park, um, where they connected into it. Uh, assembly line, this is ICS type of stuff. That's obviously uh, something we watch out. Parking lot kiosks. They broke into parking lot kiosks. Um, and I, I have a client that I do CISO service for them, and we did a PCI review. And we, we, they have parking lot uh, kiosks for their parking garages. Um, and that was another concern that we had uh, beyond just the credit card reading, but it was also uh, what are we going to do about um, the concerns of um, them just hacking that device and turning it into something. Uh, uh, so uh, somebody asked, other than conventional firewall rules uh, and these bogus domains used in command codes, are you know, intelligent incorporated in so-called next generation firewalls. You're starting to see that. Um, you, there's a lot of them. I, when I was at RSA, I probably everybody was telling me that they have the next generation of everything. Uh, but again, most of that is probably uh, uh, sales talk, right? Uh, next year, it'll be the new stuff that's the next generation. Um, so yes, some of the stuff is on firewall. Some of it is doing network monitoring. Um, we just talked about, um, and we resell it. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'll just tell you about it. Uh, Darktrace has something that watches a network, east and west, north and south, and it watches all connections between devices, and it uses artificial intelligence to look for anomalies. Um, and it learns the network, so you don't have to program it with rules. It starts to learn what normal traffic is. Uh, and then because they also uh, monitor so many other organizations, they use that information to kind of pump back into your device that's monitoring your network and to kind of tell you them. Um, there's other types of similar types of uh, devices or uh, services like that that are starting to watch your network on that side. And it's not after the fact. You can't do, so I had a, a friend of mine say, oh, you know, I don't want something like that. I, why do I need that? I can pack, capture packets myself and look them up. And I asked them, I said, when do you have time to do that? You're the systems administrator. You've got to be dealing with all the end user problems, and you're going to packet capture all day and look at stuff. No, you don't have the time to do it. You need to get some. You need to get AI to do it, or you need to hire somebody to do it, or you get a firewall that can kind of look at all of those things 
um, uh, the traditional intrusion detection, but you want more than just detection because I don't want another flag on my desktop telling me I need to go look at something. I want uh, intrusion prevention. I want something that is going to disconnect that connection. Um, so if you're in the market for looking for those type of things, look for something that's going to automate it for you rather than give you another log that you need to look at, right? Not that looking at logs is a bad thing. I mean, there's plenty of other organizations they will offer you SOC as a service, Security Operations Center as a service, and they will go in and they'll monitor all those things for you. Great. And then they'll call you up and say, hey, I, we see, see something strange on your network. You need to go look at it. That's great. Uh, that's one way to deal. The other way to deal with it is get some kind of AI that can possibly answer that. And some firewalls are starting to implement that as a part of uh, theirs. Um, but the issue with that is there's a little bit of processing power it needs, right, in order to do intelligent uh, uh, using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and also filtering all the traffic coming in and out of the network. If you have a network that has a little bit of traffic, monitoring everything real time is not that big of a deal. But if you have a large network and a lot of bandwidth, doing everything on the fly uh, is processor intensive. And that's why sometimes you, you maybe it doesn't need to be a firewall. Maybe it needs to be a separate box. Anyways, those are just some ideas that I have. Uh, if anybody else has another idea, send it in the questions, and I will uh, announce it to everybody else. There's all kinds of things out there like uh, Shodan ICS radar that tells you these are just ICS devices that are can be seen from the Internet. It just scans the Internet, see if it can find it, finds it, and then posts it here. Um, this is used by, like, good guys, right? Um, so if if this is seen by them and they're not by by any means they're not like trying to connect to everything out there in the internet, you know the bad guys have all of this plus more, right? So they have all the stuff that we don't see that's connected. Uh, somebody says HP has several products that holistically work together with their distribution distribution switches firewall that uh, looks at least uh, east and west traffic. And also encrypts it along the way uh, and has a great SIEM product or SIEM product. Um, so there you go. There's uh, somebody else that has something for you um, to answer your question. Uh, yeah, this is a funny story. Some You can go look it up. I'm not going to bother you with it because I want to make sure I finish everything up. I got a half an hour. So uh, get, now let's get to the solution. We've heard enough about the problems, right? Um, let's talk about the solution. So. I'm an IT auditor, so I'm always talking about governance. Uh, and we stopped saying IT governance uh, a while ago, and maybe people haven't noticed it, but um, we start talking now about governance of information technology. The reason why we do that is because as soon as we say IT, executive management turns their ears off and points at the IT department. As soon as we, as an auditor, as soon as I come in, if I'm meeting with, you know, the finance director, city manager, uh, district manager, and I say something IT governance, they just, eh, um, that's for IT, go talk to IT. Okay, the problem is IT governance isn't IT's job. It's executive management's job. Um, and so, so, and not just us, my organization, but the, our industry of auditors and uh, assessors and stuff like that, we've changed the way we talk about things. We need to say governance of information and technology because they understand financial governance and they understand risk governance and all that stuff. They don't understand governance of information and technology. But when we talk about information, uh, governance of information and technology, we're talking about IT governance, which is typically when I'm in an audit and I come and visit you, that's what I'm talking about usually. We're talking about IoT governance, which is something that doesn't quite exist, but kind of is implied. And we're talking about OT governance, which also doesn't exist, but is implied. We're talking about whatever the technology is, how do we govern it? In other words, how do we – and so everybody's going to ask me the next question is, okay, what do you mean by governance? Okay, so what we're talking about governance is there's two goals, two main goals. And, and depending on what governance framework you're going to look at, they'll have four or six or whatever. But if you take those four or those six and you kind of shrink them into uh, their essence, you're going to come up with these two things. These are the two things that IT's kind of job is to do. And, and whatever the technology you have for the city or the district, these two things it needs to do. One – you need to ensure value is brought to the organization. You don't buy IT stuff unless it does something for the organization. If it doesn't improve things, then it was a waste of money. I mean, that's what it comes down to. The other thing is that we need to ensure that we identify and address risks that that technology brings to the organization. Now, I'm going to tell you that it doesn't matter to me as an auditor or as an IT director. I don't care whether it's IT, IoT, or OT. 
I need to ensure that it brings out value to the organization, and I need to ensure that it uh, we uh, identify the risks and we identify them and we address them. Right? The two things I got to do makes everything really simple when you have two rather than the top five, top ten. Um, I, I did read an article that says when you're doing a presentation, always tell them that the top three things, the top five things, and you try to make it like this. And I'm like, well, sometimes it's the top forty things that you need to do, and I can't really crunch it into, you know, three. But in this case, I actually can because everything else that I will tell you about that you can do to kind of protect these things falls under these categories. And mostly we're going to talk about the insuring risks are identified and addressed is mostly what I'm going to talk about. Ensuring the value is brought to the organization. Um, while that's an important part of it, I'm the cybersecurity side of things. So I'm, I'm more of that guy. But uh, I'm sure the engineers have no problem telling you why it's bringing value to the organization how they monitor that, how they have metrics to do that, I don't know. But let's talk about the cybersecurity side of things and what we can do and what's being done right now. So one of the big things that NIST uh, 853, which is the catalog of controls, one of the things that they're adding into it and the NIST, new NISC risk management framework, which is not the cybersecurity framework, this is the one that the federal government has to use. Um, it's recommended for everybody else to use, but then they also have the cybersecurity framework which confuses everybody. Why does NIST have two frameworks? Well, they work kind of together. Uh, the risk management framework's more your friend than not. It actually requires that business uh, uh, executives and owners of uh, business operations take accountability for the risks to their systems. And I think as an IT person, you would like that much more. In other words, the finance director makes the call on if the controls on the finance system are adequate enough not you. And why is that good? Because when something goes south, it's not your butt, right? And I'm not, and I'm not trying to be like adversarial about this, but it's their business process. They understand the risk to their business process. They're the one that can accept that risk or not accept that risk. And you sort of want them to do it. I don't know what the risk is to finance, right? I, I do backups every so often, right? I don't know how important those backups are and the recovery and how much, uh, data they want to re-input into the system if it failed, right? That's a conversation we have to have. But they're the ones that need to make the decision. And then when they say, I want hourly backups, then you go, okay, well, if you want hourly backups, here's the price tag. And they're going to say, whoa, I don't want hourly backups. I can deal with weekly or daily or something like that. That's how you get that compromise. They make the decision on what risk they accept. We just tell them what it is and what the price tag is, right? Um, then everybody's, everybody's at the table. We have this, like, what we, I call shared responsibility. They're responsible. We're responsible. We work together. It's on the IT network. I got to make sure that we have basic controls, that your system is not going to break into anybody else's system or cause risk to anybody else's system. But then also, your business process, that risk that's related to it, I got to make sure that you understand what the risk is to it so that you can then make the decision whether or not it is. Um, and, and that's and, and that's a... That's more the governance side of things. That's not the IT management side of things. That's the governance side of things. Um, and I think we do a, a good job of telling people about IT management. We don't do a good job of talking about IT governance. Because, again, that's kind of outside of – sometimes it's outside the IT realm. But it's not really. It's about getting people together, IT together with the end user departments and the heads of those departments and executive management, um, uh, that they need to understand what the risk is and they need to be able to address it. Talking with some organizations that have been hit with ransomware, talking with city managers and stuff like that and interviewing them, asking them, hey, did you understand that ransomware was a risk? And I would have them come back and say, well, you know, I heard about it. I know about Atlanta, but I didn't know that we were at risk. And I'm like, okay, how did you not know <laughs> that you have systems just like theirs? Um, they have a bigger IT department, bigger IT budget. Why wouldn't you think that you were at risk? Uh, you know, it's one of the questions I ask, and and I think that what you find, and part of that is getting city managers to address that. Now, I have a lot of clients that city managers sometimes, when I try to talk to them about risk, they don't want to hear about it. Um, and and I'm sorry if you're in that situation, um, but um, I think they're starting to get the picture um, because now city managers are talking with one another. They all do, just like in MESAC, all the IT managers talk to each other. Um, so getting into those groups, um, I'm doing classes for um, the risk management uh, group. So I'm talking to all the risk managers for all the cities because they all start asking questions like, we understand there's cyber risk. What should we do about it? 
We don't know. We understand how to deal with risks of workers' comp and, you know, uh, streets, you know, having potholes. And we understand those risks, but we don't understand the cyber risk. And so we're starting to introduce that to them by giving them training on what governance should be. One of the things that, again, that's a long segue to get into this, sorry. Um, one of the things that we that this added to um, their risk management framework was to supply chain risk management. And that is your supply chain, looking at your supply chain, what are the products that you're buying and what are the risks related to them? And it's not just about the risks related to the, um, uh, looking at the risk that they might have a Chinese, uh, you know, hidden chip in there that's going to send, you know, information to them. But it's also looking at the thing about, what threats, what are the vulnerabilities? One of the vulnerabilities that we can talk about right now is the vulnerability that if you don't pay the bill, they may disconnect you and then your IoT device doesn't work, right? So that's another type of risk. It's not one that we always think about, but that is one of the risks that we have to be concerned about in this situation. So, um, and then when we look at supply chain risk, we have to look at other types of things. I know there's a lot of gray market devices out there and sometimes we are low on budget. And so we're not even aware that we're buying a gray market item. And so what's a gray market item? So um, you have black market, which are counterfeits. So if you had a phone system and you need to buy a new phone, phone handsets for them. Um, so you go online, you look, and you go to the, the manufacturer. The manufacturer wants $300 a handset. And you're like, geez, I don't have a budget for that. You go online, you just start searching around. All of a sudden, you find one for 150 same model number. And you're like, whoa, $150? I'm going to buy that one. So here's the issue. That is probably a gray market item. So whether you're buying Cisco phones or Avaya or whoever's selling the phones, when you buy those phones, there's price locking out there. So manufacturers set a price and resellers cannot sell it at any other price other than that price. They have a low, the, the lowest that they can sell it for. Um, and pretty much everybody sells at the lowest one because they want to get the services of setting up the phones and all that kind of stuff. So the way they make their money is setting up the phones. So when you go out there and you find the vendor that implemented it for you, if it's an authorized vendor, they're, they're, they're going to tell you, hey, we can only sell it to you at this price. Then you try and try and find it some other place at another price. Guess what? Here's the problem. With gray market things, you don't know what the source of it is. It may have come out the back door of the uh, factory floor. It may have been a returned item. Um, it may not be able to do uh, – uh, you may not be able to do patches and updates to it. So now you have this new device. Yes, you paid less for it, but now it's a liability on your network. It may not be able to be patched. It may not be able to uh, – uh, it, it, it may not even work properly, and then you may not be able to get support for it. Um, so, yeah, you got a cheaper price, um, but it, it has no warranty, and it, and it just becomes all kind. Of, it may have other vulnerabilities. Um, and then you have black market items, which are things that are um, com complete counterfeits, right? So the th items I was talking about may have been made by the manufacturer um, or the manufacturer has a, a contract with a company in uh, China that may build it. And, and I'm not picking on China. Don't, don't think that I am. I'm just telling because this is like an actual example where they send it to the factory there to get built. And then at nighttime, they, the factory keeps on working, building them, but sells them through other channels. Right. So you're getting, yeah, you're getting the same device sometimes, but are you? But you also don't get the warranty and all that other stuff. So, so the supply chain is more than just uh, that. You have to look at the company. Is the company going to be around when you need them to be around? Do they provide support? Look at devices that they sold three years ago. Are they still supporting those devices? Right? Because that's a good indication. If you buy something today, if you're going to have support for it for three years. If you buy phone handsets, you don't think that you're, you're going to want to make sure that you have them for a, a, a period of time, right? You're not expecting to buy new ones every year, right? So um, you want to make sure that they're going to keep up with you. And if you if you're assumed that the life of this camera or this phone system or door readers or whatever is going to be five years, you want to make sure you've got support and patches for all five years. So if there's a vulnerability, they're going to take care of it with those five years. Um, so what we kind of find, is the, here's one of the big stark differences between IoT and OT. IoT, there are all, there's almost no support period, right? You buy it, you put it in, and you're, you're done. Every year they kind of come up with a new model. Maybe even twice a year they come up with a new model. Uh, a good example of that is some of the, like, uh, 
the, the home thermometers and, and home cameras and stuff like that, uh, a year later you go and try and buy it, you may get something that looks the same, but it's a completely different model. Uh, and the updates available for it may not uh, uh, work on the older one, right? So you have to look at that. So they have, they have sometimes they have a much wider range of models. Uh, their answer to you having a problem with that device is buy a new device. You just replace it. Um, and typically, there's very limited software for it. Uh, and many of them are cloud-based these days, so you just have to use a cloud-based system. OT or ICS-type systems usually have a longer support period. They have a model longevity, so they'll keep the same model around for, you know, three years or so. It's the same model. They make it exactly the same way. So there's a narrower range. You don't have a wider range of products out there that you have to look at. Um, they, many of them, like if you have a PLC or something like it has, is can be repaired. You can buy parts for it, take out the motherboard, stick a new motherboard in there because everything else still works. So they have those types of things. You don't have that for basically the consumer type of things, which is the IoT. Um, they have limited software that works with it, and most of their products have on-prem servers or workstations that you have to control everything with. Um, so those are some of the differences between those. Um, and so you have to look at that as part of the life cycle when you're uh, part of your supply chain management, risk management. It's kind of like looking at what kind of device it is. And then you kind of have to look. This graphic I know looks kind of like a little crazy. But uh, each one of these bars over here is telling you how long the software is being supported and how long the hardware is being supported and if it works with the software that you're using, if it's hardware and the hardware if it's the software. All right, so that does sound confusing, doesn't it? Look at it this way. You buy, let's say you buy a phone system, um, and you buy handsets for that phone system. And, or no, not, I'm, let's just talk about the hardware. So I buy the, the phone system, and I have the, the chassis for it. And the chassis has the processors and RAM and all that stuff into it. Uh, the hardware I bought, you know, maybe I spent $60,000 on it. The software that's on it, maybe 20000 you're running it for a lifetime, right? And version two of the software comes out, you upgrade to it. Version three comes out, great, we upgrade to it. Version four comes out, great, upgrade to it. Version five comes out, and it doesn't work with the hardware that you have. Now you have to upgrade the hardware in order to get the version five of the software. Now, so what ends up happening with a lot of devices is the hardware software cycles are in different cycles, and in order for the vendor to continue to support that hardware, they have to do all kinds of other stuff. And so what they uh, end up doing is basically uh, cutting you off because they don't want to support that hardware anymore, and so they have a cutoff on it. And the question is, what is that cutoff going to be for you? So if you're buying a new product and I'm buying a brand-new system, I ask them, say, okay, how long should I expect – because I need to figure out the total life, uh, total cost of ownership for something. I need to know what the life is going to be. You know, if I buy a new phone system, I want it to last at least seven years or something. Who knows? Um, even though technology is changing constantly, right? I want it to last seven years. Is the software going to be able to be updated throughout that entire life cycle? And, and oftentimes you can't get the answer. Sometimes the vendors are like, yes, we'll support it. We'll see seven years from now whether they actually do. Um, because what they get into is a, is a point where if everybody's on newer hardware and you're the last holdout because you don't have the budget for it, they're going to stop supporting it. So what, then what do you end up doing? You either buy a whole new system or you keep on with the old system. You keep on with the old system, now you have a new set of risks. You have an obsolete system that no longer has patches that you have now implemented on your network. That's a whole other set of risks that you have. So you have all kinds of possibilities of zero-day exploits um, and uh, – things of that nature that you have to deal with, right? So the other thing you have to deal with in all of this is the vulnerability management, which comes up with patch uh, availability. What about infrastructure support? Um, generally, when we make new network connections, we make it so it's backwards compatible, right? So uh, we have Cat5, we have Cat7, all this kind of stuff, use the same connector. So if I have an old Cat5, I can still connect in with it, so it will work with my new infrastructure. Um, you know, think about, uh, remember DVDs came out, now we have 4K discs. Well, on my 4K, 4K player, I can still play a DVD, right, because it was backwards compatible. We use the same format uh, going backwards or going forward. We just added capacity to it. So if, as long as our infrastructure can continue to do that, then we probably don't have any problem. But if the infrastructure takes a major leap or change, 
like changing to IP version 6, um, is our hardware going to be able to support it, right? So those are the types of things that uh, may hold back other innovations or hold us back from uh, upgrading to other things. Um, and then looking at things is when is the mainstream support versus extended support? So mainstream support may be for five years, and then extended support can get kind of costly. Our phone system, why well, I'm kind of complaining about them a lot, I guess. Um, our phone system, we, we ran out of the uh, regular support system, and we've upgraded the software to the highest level we can. Now we're in extended support, where we have to pay for, and it's more expensive than the regular support was. So now we're kind of, you know, we're in a situation where like, uh, we're going to have to make a decision. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a decision we wanted to make this soon. Uh, but I think part of the process when purchasing is looking at the supply chain, kind of figuring out like how often are they updating stuff, and then figuring out when are we going to have to update stuff um, and checking out with it. Um, so accountability, Federal Trade Commission has started kind of holding businesses uh, uh, accountable for um, creating stuff they knew was insecure. Um, but uh, I haven't seen a whole lot moving in that direction. Um, but I think you'll see more of that in the future. I definitely think that that's one of the things. Uh, we're starting to see um, patch management. So here's the interesting thing. Uh, if you don't work in the hospital industry, you don't know this. Patch management for uh, uh, medical devices has to go through testing, extensive testing, uh, just like drugs have to go through extensive testing before they get released. And so we're all talking about the COVID uh, virus. We're talking about there might be a vaccine. They need to do all the FDA testing. They're trying to fast, -track, fast track that testing. Um, so the FDA is trying to figure out, because um, a lot of vendors are saying we can't issue a patch because if we issue a patch, we have to pay money to the FDA to have them go through and do the testing that's necessary for us to get their seal of approval and so patches are not getting applied to those medical devices as soon as they should be. It's not like Microsoft has to go to the government and say, hey, can you test our patch before we send it out, right? Uh, if they did, do you think we'd have all the patches? No, we would be waiting, you know, a year for a patch, uh, which leaves us vulnerable. That's the problem we have with the medical devices. So the FDA is trying to come back with and say, hey, uh, minor patches don't have to have the testing, but major revisions have to. Making a clear line on what is a patch and what is a revision is problematic, but they're working. They understand that there's a risk to it, but think about that next time you're in the hospital and stuck to a ventilator, um, that it may not be patched because the FDA is holding it back. Now, here's the thing. You want to make sure that it works properly, um, so you don't want to be put on a ventilator that doesn't work, <laughs> right? So now, uh, so there's like this, this give and take here of uh, productivity and risk management. And uh, the FDA always is on the side of risk management. You know, we need to make sure it's 100% safe, otherwise we don't release it because it's a life in line. But then on the other side, well, we need more ventilators, right? Um, so anyways, uh, this is part of the supply chain management we need to understand. We need to understand that we have these devices that it's going to take some time uh, to get patches for them. That means something vulnerable being be on our network. Uh, and we're it, luckily, we, talking to local governments, so we're not talking with healthcare. They have their own set of troubles. Here's the California uh, legislation. They said reasonable security, and then you go look up what reasonable security is, and it's no default passwords. Um, and I'm disappointed in that, but we're not gonna dwell on it. Now, we all know that we shouldn't have default passwords, right? I mean, it was in Spaceballs, <laughs> and I've seen it on so many other things lately, uh, where they, you know, the default password, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, not a good password, right? Um, so the UK did come up with a consumer IoT security. So this doesn't necessarily help businesses, but a lot of businesses are using those consumer IoT devices. They're actually having, hey, you have to go through this validation process. They came up with a whole framework. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, we're starting to see that, and they're starting to implement it. NIST is now coming up with guidelines for IoT devices. These aren't for us necessarily. This is more um, for manufacturers saying, manufacturers, these are things you need to be able to do. You need to be able to find vulnerabilities. You need to be able to patch those vulnerabilities. Um, and you need to be able to do it in a timely manner. So those types of things are starting to happen. Uh, and that's a good thing for us. Um, but it's kind of not here yet. So we're still in the process for it. Uh, they're looking at, you know, uh, looking at the, the looking at challenges, what the expectations are, what, is, what do end users, the people that are using the software want? 
what are the risk mitigation goals and areas? What kinds of risks do we need to uh, think? What kind of risks do we need to consider uh, for IoT devices? It's basically the same risk that we have for regular computers, isn't it? Except for there's no keyboard, nobody's sitting at it. Um, but all the other same risks uh, kind of exist for those things. So uh, my slides aren't moving forward. There we go. And another graphic for the NIST guidelines, which you can go and download and, and check out what they're talking about. Industry leaders are now starting to, on the ICS side of things, are starting to come forward and say, hey, we need to have this thing called Charter of Trust. Uh, we need to take leadership and try to address cybersecurity. And we understand that we are the supply chain, therefore we need to work on that. So they came up with their 10 principles uh, on the Charter of Trust, uh, which you can check out. Check out. Um, I think Siemens is the main pusher of this. Um, uh, but there's a lot of other organizations in there. And this is the first time, well, it's not the first time, but you have an industry that says, we understand that we need to be more secure. This is what we're going to try and do. Um, so they've got some great uh, ideas. They're actually even asking for regulation. Um, they're doing the smart thing. They're trying to propose legislation before it gets proposed on them. Now, this is like the fox in the hen house too, right? So. I'm an auditor and I, I trust but verify. So great that uh, somebody says, hey, you should regulate me and hey, this is how you should regulate me. Great, okay, I'll take that into consideration. But we need to have other people outside of uh, the vested interest folks to say, yes, that is a good framework to have. So uh, I'm hoping that as uh, the legislatures look at this stuff, they don't fall for the lobbyists and say, oh yeah, that's great, we're gonna do that hope they make sure that it's um, uh, done and in a manner that um, indicates that uh, it's been peer reviewed by someone other than somebody that doesn't have vested interest in it. Um, and I think that that's one of the things we'll need to do. So again, the, the risk you're gonna have with the supply chain, did they make it secure design and manufacturing? Uh, did they support software and hardware life cycle, the whole life cycle? How long am I gonna be able to keep this before I have to get rid of it? My I have a Jeep, as you've heard earlier, and it has this stupid computer inside of it. And the very next year, they came out with a new computer. The new computer has Android Auto, which does all these really cool things with your phone, pairs your phone, and you can do all the hands-free stuff. The one I have is not supported anymore. So I can't get any of that cool stuff. And in order to get that, I would have to buy a whole new headset, and apparently I can't buy it for mine with the new system. I have to use the old system. So I don't like that. I bought a car, I spent a lot of money on a car, and it's out of date within a year. I mean, I can't take advantage of any of the new stuff. So their, their idea of software support and hardware life cycle sucks, um, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't want to pick on Jeep, because I like Jeep and all that stuff. But all the car manufacturers, they just want you to buy a new one. Um, and I don't want to buy a new one. It's, I want the drive this one until I roll it on some back road someplace. Um, but unfortunately, I can't upgrade to the newer uh, uh, computer system, so I can't get any of the newer stuff, and they're not supporting it other than what they need to support to make sure the engine runs. So that's kind of a boring thing, right? So the same type of thing that we have with all the other vendors, um, and yeah, I'm talking about cars, but we're kind of seeing the same thing across the way. We want to make sure that they're looking at the vulnerabilities, they're patching those things. Do they have some type of validation or verification they have? it? Um, one of the things that they were asking for in that uh, Charter Trust is certification for integrators. So the person that's implementing the device, so somebody who's implementing the new camera system or the building automation system, that they understand and know uh, cybersecurity risks. And there's certifications for that. So you want to make sure that they have certification. Now, there's a lot of certifications around ICS, and you can take a look at all of these. Here's a big, long list of them. I'm not going to go through all of them for you, um, but they're all out there. Some of them are, like, specific to the water industry. Um, but if you're in the water industry, um, I would go beyond what they have. I would look kind of at NIST 882, which, by the way, most of these all reference. Interesting point um, of contention. Um, so... ISA, IEC uh, 62443, if you've seen that one, they align all their controls with what NIST and ISO has. So you may be familiar with NIST 853. They take all of these controls that they have in here and align them with 853. So you can see where it aligns with NIST, right? So, um, 
So what does that tell you? That tells you that in 53, there is a way to take that control and implement it into an OT environment. Um, so if you don't have ISA 62443, if you implement the controls that are in 853, you are going to be further ahead. Um, the uh, uh, G43014, uh, the Security Practice and Operation Management, talks about water, water waste, and reuse utilities. Um, they have the minimum requirements for protective security. Um, this is sometimes why I don't like engineers trying to come up with it. If you read through the security controls, the, their control catalog is terrible. It has, it has a section, like section four, and then it goes to section five, and it seems like it's not talking about controls anymore, but then it is. Uh, so one, the way they document their controls is not very orderly. And then two, they're using terms that are like protective security. What the heck is that? It's cybersecure. They're just using a different term. Why can't we just standardize and use what everybody else is using as terms? Um, this is what happens when you have, like, uh, an organization off on the left field trying to come up with their own cybersecurity stuff. They have some great things that you have to do, and they call it minimal, and they also tell you that you shouldn't do your minimum. So that's all great, good, um, but NIST already had guidelines that, that far exceed it. So if you're doing the NIST I, uh, 800, uh, what was the number? Uh, you're doing everything that it asks for and then some. So, look, Section 14 or Section 4 of uh, G14 has all these controls. You get up to 13, but then you have to go to Section 5 that says documentation, training, and equipment testing is a part of what you need to do. And so I'm like, why is Section 4 the controls, but then Section 5 has a couple of the controls in there that are not listed in Section 4? If you look in any other framework, Everything is numbered and laid out so that you can grab a list of what you need to do and do it. Um, granted, you can do you can do the same thing here, but then you kind of have to read the whole document and kind of look under all the nooks and crannies. Like this paragraph doesn't look like it's talking about a control, but it does say something. It sounds like it's a control. Well, it's a control. Anyways, I don't want to pick on them. It's a good standard. You should be doing that, um, but you should be looking beyond it as well because, again, that's the minimal security. Medical devices, I'm not going to spend time with that. Um, but there's a partnership to work on, and they have a concept of shared responsibility too, and that is the responsibility of the vendor to make good equipment that can be secure, and then also the implementer who implements it to implement it uh, properly, and then the owner of the equipment to maintain it properly, right? They all have a part to do, and that's that shared responsibility idea. Now, look at all this wonderful graphic I made here. So NIST 853, that control catalog that if you're on my audit, I ask you those questions. If you're not, um, that's the, what we look at. If you look at NIST Special Publication 882, which is the OT uh, side of things, it relates directly to NIST 853. So it maps all of its controls to there. ISO 27001 maps all of its controls to 853. COBIT, which is the Control Objectives for Information and Technology, which is a governance framework, also uh, basically aligns with NIST 853. The ISA, um, SEC, the OT control a catalog that we looked up earlier, also aligns with 853. Uh, if you look at uh, the AWA voluntary stuff, it aligns with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, the critical controls are less align with the NIST cybersecurity framework. COVID also aligns with it. And Guess what NIST cybersecurity framework is going to tell you to go to figure out how to do all of, the, all of its objectives? It's going to point you to 853. The risk management framework, the one I was talking about earlier that the federal government has to use, also points to 853 as these are the things that you need to do to address cyber risks. So the question is, okay, so let's pick one of them. Uh, I think it's SI3. Uh, the control SI3 in NIST 853 is that you have to have uh, anti-malware uh, protection. So, okay, you're going to say, okay, Don, uh, that, that's not going to work. There's no antivirus for our OT devices. You're absolutely right. But that control exists because there is something called malware and that we need to do something to address the risk of malware. So the question I always say is if you take 853 and you say, okay, how am I going to apply this to an OT or IOT device? First thing is, there's malware that exists for it. How am I going to address it? Uh, Anti-malware anti software is not going to work because it doesn't exist. So what other type of control can I put in there that will address malware for those devices? 
whether it is having a SOC and monitoring all the traffic or an AI that monitors all the traffic, that is one way to actually monitor uh, for malware, right? So you can still implement some type of malware control on an OT device. It's just not, we have to think differently. We can't just think, oh, I'm going to buy Norton or McAfee and I'm going to apply it to it because it doesn't work that way. But how do I make sure that I'm addressing the fact that it can be infected with malware, right? There's different ways to do it. Zero Trust Network and stuff like that can kind of address some of those things. Um, again, these devices we don't have a lot of control over. The most of the control that we sometimes have is on the network side of things. So we'll have to implement those types of controls on the network. So we're going to end up taking a lot of the controls that NIST 853 and network, make them on the network side of things to actually address those risks. So, uh, so a question, great topic. Where does NERC uh, uh, critical infrastructure protection fit in? Um, it also points towards 853, although I'd have to go and look. Um, I believe there is a map existing. So if you look for uh, the NERC and you ask for a map for it, you should have one that kind of points you to 853. Uh, most people kind of point back to that because 853 is the largest catalog and has more controls than anybody else, um, even than ISO. And that's why ISO even points towards it. Um, there, ISO doesn't point towards it directly. Other people have to make the mapping for you, but it's all there. Um, and, and again, so the way I look at it is, if you want to keep it simple, uh, just look at ANR53 and look at the controls. Now, there's different levels of controls, and I can't get into all the controls here today because some of them are not applied. Those are extra controls that you can implement if, uh, as compensating controls if you can't implement. So if you can't implement anti-malware software on a device, what are some of the compensating controls that you can put into there? When, when, when I used to do uh, risk management for NASA, and they would always come to me and say, well, you need to do a risk assessment, and we don't know how to do it. Um, and I said, hey, look at 853. See all these controls? One of these controls says that you need to do patch management. One of them says you have to do anti-malware. One of them says this. All of those controls exist. Why? Because there's a risk. So go look at the control and say, it's I3, whatever it is. It says you have to have anti-malware. What is the risk? Malware. Great. You're doing a, a risk assessment backwards. Really, you're supposed to say, okay, what are the risks? There's malware. Okay, what are the control you're going to implement? Okay, uh, anti-malware, <laughs> right? So I just told them to do it backwards. Start with the catalog and then move backwards and then look at all the controls that, uh, that are existing there and figure out um, what kind of, uh, how you can implement or what the, I'm saying start with the controls, go backwards, figure out what your risks are. Now you know what your risks are. Now, if the control doesn't doesn't exist, how do you invent a control that will? Uh, another question: Do you think there will ever be an NG endpoint security software like CrowdSite made for OT PCs, perhaps with DMZ server they connect uh, that hops to the internet? And that's a good question. Um, actually, um, that is a really good question. I think it's inevitable that it will happen. Um, is it going to happen now? I'm not sure, but I would recommend um, that we we push back on our vendors that make IoT devices and um, uh, OT devices and tell them, I want your OT device patch management to work with the patch management system I already have. I want, and then I would go to my patch management system. If you have a patch management system, not like I'm not talking about Microsoft. Because uh, Microsoft does a really good job of updating their stuff, but nobody else's, right? So if you want to have complete patch management, you want to have an automated system that does it, you want something that will patch Microsoft, patch Adobe, patch uh, your finance system, and patch everything. And, and I know that's a pipe dream, right? Because most of us, the finance system isn't going to go through the, the normal patch management uh, uh, machine unless we take the packages, uh, change them into packages that the system can then push out. Um, we're probably not going to get there. But if we keep on pushing back to the industry and saying, this is what we need, I, I don't know. I, sometimes I feel like in IT we have a hard time telling everybody else what we need. We, we like to listen to vendors saying, hey, this is what you need and this is what you got. Instead of us pushing back and saying, hey, you know what I want? I want to have a, a system that will help me patch everything, including my OT devices. Um, right, I don't want to have to have three different patch management systems. Uh, although it's if you can have three different patch management systems, that's good. If you didn't have to manually do it, it's better than what we're doing. 
but it's still not where we need to be. Um, I think with NIST coming out with the IoT uh, guidelines, which, by the way, they're in draft form, and this is where you can have a say in things like this, is you can look at the draft and say, hey, NIST, did you ever think that you missed this? And there you, may, you, you make a reply. When it's open for discussion, you can comment on uh, all their standards, uh, and even after it is uh, done and they're working on the next version of the standard, you have an opportunity to comment on it and tell them what it needs. Um, and if you need something like that, unified patch management, you should tell them. Um, uh, that's one of the things I, I do oftentimes uh, make recommendations on NIST guidelines uh, because I want to see them make things better. So hopefully we'll get some kind of endpoint security for these types of devices. Uh, I think with chips getting smaller and things and processors getting better, you, you, you're going to end up with a point where a camera can have a full full PC inside of it, right? You know, not a full PC, but, you know, uh, have the capabilities of, of, of actually possibly running uh, monitoring software. Maybe they'll call it monitoring software that does monitoring of not just um, uh, the device itself, but also just the security side of things. Um, so hopefully that'll come up. Now, the cybersecurity framework is what everybody is telling you guys in local governments to use. So great. Go ahead and use it. Uh, it's a great way for you to report to management and all that stuff. But it's only objectives. It's not controls. It's not telling you what to do. It says you, you should have a, a process to do this. Okay, great. You have a process to do that. But what should that process look like? That This, this framework doesn't tell you all that. So what does it tell you? It gives you a column on the right-hand side that tells you go to NIST 853 and look these controls up. Go to ISO here and look these controls up. Every one of the controls, except for like three of them, all point back to 853. And by the way, the three that don't are about having um, – uh, somebody who's in charge of public relations, that if you have an incident, somebody who's going to talk to the public. And and that's not really 853. It's not in 853, uh, but it's kind of it, – because that's more of a non-IT issue. That's more of a, you know, emergency uh, um, communications plan. Anyways, so you may uh, – anyways, all, all the other controls, all the other objectives that are in there point back to a control. But here's the nice thing about the cybersecurity framework is you can use that also across all of your devices, across your IoT devices, across your um, uh, uh, normal network, and across your ICS network. And so if you actually – let's take an example uh, where you can actually look at it. So if you look at this NIST cybersecurity framework objective, IDAM-1, it says physical devices and systems within the organization are inventory. And you heard me talk about inventory earlier there. Now, look, if you look at the CIS critical controls, it's control number one and number two. Well, control number one was physical, and then control number two was software, and they may have combined them two. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, the critical uh, information security controls, the top 20, some people call it, that is basically very general security. It aligns perfectly with the cybersecurity framework. So if you're using that, you can report back up to the cybersecurity framework. If you're using COBIT, which is the governance uh, side of things, BIA, 09.01 and 0.02, uh, go back to that. You have to have an inventory. If you look at ISA, the OT requirements that I talked about, uh, there are two different uh, uh, standards there. Both of them say that you need to have an inventory of uh, hardware devices. And if you look at ISO and NIST, which are both basically looking at IT side of things, you know, the traditional IT, both of them say you need to have an inventory of physical devices and all this. What I'm trying to say is you don't have to rework the wheel for everything. These all work together, and, and don't try to do separate things. Like if you're trying to do CGIS, I, I get it. You have to do it. You have to follow their rules. But guess what? All their stuff points back to this 853. So if you just do 853 and implement it as strictly as you can everywhere that you can, you're going to cover a lot of these different areas and not even necessarily know it. But the idea, the objective of making sure that you have an inventory of hardware devices is found in all of them, right? So, I mean, I don't want to say pick one and use it. You got Sometimes you have to comply with different things like NERC or CGIS. But know that it doesn't have to be different. It doesn't have to be a different event. You just need to have a process to make sure that you have a physical inventory of devices. And then you check off all of these that you're, do, you're compliant with all of those standards, right? You see what I'm saying? I, I, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you. So if you use the NIST cybersecurity framework, great. 
Use that to gap your way across everything else so that everything, whether it's IT or OT or just general security, can all be mapped to it. You have one dashboard that you can show management and say, hey, this is how we're doing. You know, if they want to get into the weeds, then you can pull up NIST 1053 and say, okay, here's all the specific controls and here where we are on all of those things, right? Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's a lot simpler than we sometimes make it. Yes, there's a lot of different standards and we kind of get worried about them. And, some, you know, I talked to an, uh, a client the other day and they're in a water district and they're like, you know, we're looking at this ISA stuff and, you know, we don't get these uh, standards and they have all these references. I said, well, look at the, the standards there. You see the NIST? Yeah. Well, that's the same stuff we're asking you in the audit. Why don't you go back and look at that NIST document and see if you understand that better? Um, they, and then they did, and they came back and said, okay, we understand how this fits to IT. Now, how does this fit to I, OT, right? That's where that kind of came in, right? And so we just sat, we sat down and said, okay, what's the risk that we're talking about? So this risk exists for the OT. Now, how do we implement this idea of an inventory of hardware? How do we implement that in this situation, right? So we don't have to – I think a lot of people get intimidated, especially when you look at NIST 853. It's like hundreds of pages long, right? And then there's a whole bunch of – you have to – the where the, all the controls are listed is in the appendix, right? So you have to read through everything to get to the appendix, which is the largest part of the document. Um, but there's good reason for that. They want you to explain how they uh, have documented the control, what the subcontrols are, why there's different baselines for each of the controls, um, because if you have a low-level system, you don't put the same level of controls you do on a high system, right? It's not cost-effective. Um, and so, uh, again, I, I think there's a lot of stuff and a lot of guidance out there that can help us in working them together or using one as like the master framework, so to speak, and everything else can kind of connect to it uh, is great. Um, so this cybersecurity framework, if you want to get more mature in your cybersecurity, if you if you got the NIST cybersecurity framework and you got it all connected to all the different standards for OT and IoT and you're doing a really good job at that, okay, great. Now take it up to the next level. Look at the risk management framework and get management specifically to sign off on stuff. Uh, the, the finance director is going to sign off on the risk for the finance system. Um, and that requires external assessments, on a triannual basis, so every three years you would have an assessor come in because, frankly, you're, you could tell the finance director, yes, we have all the controls in place. Um, he shouldn't believe you. That's not proper governance. He needs to have an independent third party who can verify that what you say is true. Um, that's a part of the governance aspect. Uh, and it doesn't have to be onerous. You don't have to do it every uh, year. It's usually on a three-year basis. That's what uh, – OMB recommends for the federal government, and that's how they do it. Um, I think one of the things that it forces, if implemented correctly, is that idea of shared responsibility between IT and, in this case, the finance department, right? You have to work together. Um, if you're sitting, you have to work with Parks and Rec, that there needs to be a work together, that when they buy a new system, that they need to consult with you and probably finance to make sure that their new system that they're getting that now it takes credit cards is not going to change the PCI uh, compliance requirements for the city, right? Um, this is a good example where that shared responsibility, everybody needs to be at the table, IT needs to be at the table. In this case, if it's a PCI-related thing, f finance needs to be at the table. And then the end user, if it's Parks and Rec, they need to be at the table. We all have to work together on it. Sure, Parks and Rec can make the decision what it is, but we need to tell them what the risk is. And by the way, you implement that software that way, it's going to cost the city X amount in order to implement the controls necessary to be compliant with NIST or PCI, right? That should be a part of the cost of implementing that thing. If they want a new software, great. It also costs this much to protect it if you buy it that way. Because, by the way, if you buy it this way, it's more expensive, but it's cheaper on the long run because we can maintain our compliance. Anyways, that's a side note. Uh, and we're not talking about PCI compliance here, but I just want to give you an example, a real-world example, of some of the stuff that happens. Anyways, work it all together, uh, and you don't have to uh, overwork the wheel. Um, and, again, if you're going to have people come in and implement stuff, you want to make sure that they know what they're doing. So, uh, typically, if you have somebody come in, you have someone that's going to be an auditor who's going to audit your information systems, you want to make sure they're a certified information system auditor. Now, the certification has been around since the 60s, so it's like a CPA. It's, it's 
world is recognized worldwide. Um, so you want to make sure that the people that are doing the job are qualified to do the job. Same thing with ICS cert certification. So if someone's going to implement something for you, there's actually ICS certifications for that. And so if they're going to come in and do that, one of the things you might want to put into your RFP, if you're if you have one, or uh, um, uh, or if you're evaluating a vendor who's going to come in and do something in your plant, you want to make sure. Uh, I would start pushing back to them and say, hey, uh, do you have any ICA, uh, ISA uh, certifications uh, on cybersecurity? And here's the specific ones that we're looking for. Um, this way, there's no guarantee that these people are going to do it right, but there's a higher probability, that means less risk, that they're going to implement it correctly. That means that the likelihood that them leaving in a default password is should be zero, but it's not going to be zero, but it's going to be like 99% they're probably going to do it right. Um, so it, it may be less than that. Who knows? There's still human error. And I can't, you know, you get what I'm trying to get at. You know, if they're certified, there's going to be a higher level of quality of their work product, uh, which means less risk to us, right? Of course, we should still verify what they're doing. We should understand how they've implemented it. We should understand and we should ask the questions, how have you addressed these risks? Uh, that should all be a part of them implementing something new. Uh, one of the things that we're not good at we write RFPs is having them document the risks, uh, what they've done to address certain risks, and we would address, we would put that into RFP. Here's the risk that we have. Uh, please let us know how you are going to address these risks as well, right? Um, and uh, and you can put whatever you want in there for risks. I, you know, every once in a while we uh, we respond to an RFP, and I have not seen that once yet, where they've actually asked and said, okay, here's a list of risks. We want to know what you're going to do to address these risks as a part of this. Um, you know, uh, some of them have said, um, do you have audits? And, then, and that's one, that's a shortcut way, I guess you can do that. You can say, hey, do you have audits uh, done on you that uh, address how you uh, conduct your business? Um, and that's one way to do it too. And of course, you should do that with cloud service providers as well. Uh, also, I, I mentioned it earlier, if you need to go to it, um, uh, the US CERT website for ICS, they have a specific news group or a news feed for that. Um, it just deals with the ICS system. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, you should be on it. If you're not getting the emails, um, uh, if you didn't get a whole bunch of them last week, you're probably not getting them um, because they they do them in spurts, I think, sometimes. I got like 20 last week. Um, but anyway, uh, and I'll like it within an hour um, and then nothing for a while. Um, you want to look at those things, see if you have any of those uh, devices, and then uh, figure out what you're going to do to manage those risks if you don't have uh, anything in place. If nothing else, you want to make sure that if there's engineers who manage those devices, that they're aware of what those um, uh, are. And hopefully the vendors are keeping them up to date, but who knows. So take away from this, uh, don't build a Death Star with an exhaust port, right? <laughs> right? Uh, so know what your risks are. Uh, make sure you protect the systems that you have. <clears throat> Make sure that we look at the supply chain risks and push back on that supply chain and say, hey, we want quality products. We don't want garbage that's going to uh, uh, make us more at risk for our networks. So we need to push back to them because uh, your purchasing, your dollars that you give them, uh, is the biggest motivation they have. And so if you say, we're not going to spend dollars on your products unless your products are more secure, they're going to work on security. It's just the way the market works. That requires us to stop sitting around and saying, oh, I wish they'd make better products, to us actively saying, look, you need to make better products. And this is going to be one of our major decision points. If it's not secure, if we can't have patch management, if we can't uh, uh, have some type of management for this uh, device, if you're not going to support it for X amount of years, uh, letting us know about vulnerabilities, then you're going to be very low on the checklist of people that we want to buy from. Um, that speaks louder than anything else. Um, so we have to do that. We also have to have a way until then, right? I'm, I'm talking about future. We have to work towards the future today. But now what do we need to do uh, is basically we have to detect the attacks if they're coming. Right now we have a bunch of dumb devices on our network that can't protect themselves. And so we have to figure out a way to detect those attacks. And then we have to, have to figure out a way to plan for contingencies. If all of our cameras get taken out, what are we going to do about it, right? Washington, D.C. had all their cameras taken out. What were they going to do about it? Well, they had to work until they got a six. They had no other way of doing it. Uh, so plan for those contingencies. 
look at the cybersecurity framework and NIST 853, look at those controls and say, how do I implement those controls on everything? If it touches the network, it needs to follow these controls. How do I make sure it does that? Um, and of course, like Yoda said, mind what you learn, save you it can. Um, anyways, is there any other questions? I think we're at the end, aren't we? Or did I have anything else? There's a blank slide, so that's probably the end. Yes, and together we can make the world cyber safe. So hopefully you guys can take some of this back, put implement some of this. I'm almost, I'm like five minutes away from two hours, so you get two hours worth of CPE, or continuing education if you need it. Um, so there you go. If you, if you guys have any other questions, put them in here. I'll stay on for the next five minutes, otherwise we're done. And um, thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Rob, for helping me with the slides until I was able to get back on. Oh, hey, no problem, man. That's what I'm here for. No, oh, if you're still on, my buddy Rob, he's uh, from, uh, he's an instructor at the University of Indiana. He's got his master's in cybersecurity, and he just backs me up sometimes. It's good to have somebody, uh, in case I miss speaking, and jump in and say, no, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, well, I don't see yep. any other questions. Sometimes. I'll wait for a little bit. Don't forget, if you're still on, please rate us. I think probably everybody's logging off by now. It's lunchtime. Another well, for me, question, you're in sir. Indiana, huh? Thank you. Oh, I got a question. Good team effort. Yes. See, I plan for my contingencies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, you sir. Well, you have a great one. Thank you, everybody, you for too. watching. I will. And we'll, we'll see you guys at the next one. Thank you. Uh, another comment. Great, uh, great presentation. Thank you. There's more coming up. Oh. Oh, uh, good question. Um, somebody asked, where is a good... What's a good resource to review ICS risk assessment and samples? That's a good question. I haven't seen one yet. Um, I would ask um, the MESAC group and see if anybody has any out there. I know there's a lot of water districts, and I'm sure some of them have done them. Um, I would also check with, uh, I don't know if you're water district. I'm not whoever asked the question. Um, but. Um, uh, AWBA may have some that they've done. I in their um, in their guidance they recommend that you do it. So I'm assuming that they have an idea of what one looks like. Um, you may have to go outside of California. Look, I'm sure somebody, some water district in California has done a really good one. And if not in California, then somewhere in this country, somebody's done a really good one. Um, so I would ask around to see if you can find them. But I, I would I would suggest that they're there. And 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 of course they. Hopefully, they'd be more likely to give it to you for free. Um, I, I, I think there is probably some vendors out there that specialize in ICS security that would, would help you with that. Um, you could maybe look for somebody who is certified, the ISA certified. There's a certification for ICS risk assessments. Um, uh, you may also be able to look at the materials that they have, uh, ISA website, um, to see if they have any materials um, that prepare people for getting that certification. And I think that they would have um, that. Oh, somebody else says electrical transportation as well as oil and gas are verticals I deal with. So, yeah, they, they yeah. Um, so I, I would look in uh, those types of areas. But the, the, uh, uh, the ISA deals with just ICS in general. And so I think that uh, they have a certification for it. So they got to have something on it uh, out there. You know, think about it. And, and if I wasn't going to do that, I would just do it the same way I'm telling you to do it. You, uh, the best way to start off is start with the control and work your way backwards. Why does this control exist? Why are they asking me to do this? What's the risk? And then you start filling it in. And then as you do that, you're, you're doing homework. And as you do that, you actually get to a position where you start to understand, okay, I can see what these risks are. And then you can, you know, other things will come to your mind. And you just start documenting them. Uh, and you can do it just like a regular IT document uh, thing. I think on uh, my blog, I may have had something on risk management. I don't know. If you send me a personal email, I can uh, send you a, um, 
a format that we use for IT risk management, and it would probably be very similar um, to it. So um, you want to do the same thing, right? You want to say, okay, what's the risk? Uh, what are the devices? What's the likelihood of impact? What's the likelihood of uh, what's the probability? What's the impact? What's the likelihood? Um, what controls do I put in place to minimize that? That's what you do to document it, right? Um, and it's going to be the, kind of the same. I just don't know if there's a specific formatting for ICS, but you'd want to do the same stuff. Okay. Well, that's been exactly two hours and no more questions. So with that, I will see you next time.